Hello and welcome back to Citizen Sleeper. Uh, I, I've like, I don't know, maybe, maybe I take certain things for granted, um, but I, I've been feeling a little bit frustrated with this game in some ways. Uh, and it's a weird, like uh, nothing mechanical, I guess. Um, like it's a very narrative driven game and like it, basically it is a visual novel. And so if you go in expecting a visual novel, then you'll be happy with what you find. But for me personally, I do wish that when it came to actually like playing a part in the universe that has been built up, I, I, I kind of wish that I could be more of a player and not just an observer. But uh, I'm going to stop complaining about that. Um, and we're going to see if we can tie up some loose ends before I am uh, essentially forced to join a generational ship so that Lem and Mina can actually have an ending. Um, yeah, let's, uh, let's see if we can't progress this. Uh, we'll see if anything comes of it. Uh, yeah. Collect tithes for the Yagamata. What is it? Yad yet again, not the Yagamata. <laughs> And we're probably going to be able to finish this up. We get some scrap for this, so it's genuinely worth doing. Are those just neutral? Uh, no, positive. Wow, so I only get a plus on a positive, huh? Negative. I'm starving now. Okay. We get to talk to Rabaya. This time you meet inside Rabia's office, although now that you've seen it, office seems like the wrong term. You find her stood in an almost bare, shadowy unit midway through a sequence of stretches that are... There are two low stools and a terminal in the corner, but it seems that most of the space is taken up a heady, uh, is taken up by a heavy punching bag, rubber matting, and a stack of weights. When Rabia turns to greet you, you realize she is missing an arm. The prosthetic she usually wears is set in a cradle near the terminal, a web of colored wires running to it. Updates, she says, noticing you looking where her artificial arm usually is. Nothing to worry yourself with, of course. Sit, says Rabia, gesturing to the two d diminutive stools. You both settle on the stools, Rabia cl crossing her legs on top and uh, sitting straight backed. Gia told me you have been doing the rounds, collecting tithes, patrolling the ward. She smiles. Some of the enforcers are impressed, and I hear you handled a few difficult circumstances. Nicely done. I wanted to see for myself. She raises an eyebrow. See what for yourself? How a gang operates. Rabia sighs. Then you have learned nothing, despite all the time spent among us. She closes her eyes for a moment. Sleeper, I do not wish to make an enemy of you. You have helped our cause already. Whatever your motivations, why do you resist us? I know that for you, life on the eye has been a struggle. We have not been part of that. Though some of our members may not see it this way, I know you too are a refugee. She looks at you solemnly. That is why you have come to us. Enough, Rabia. Sabine's voice cuts through the conversation. I am tired of listening to your affected nobility. They cross the room, Rabia's baton in their hand, the end lit with a sparking electricity. Rabia looks between the two of you. I suppose this ambush was another cooperation between you two? She looks strangely unfazed. No, they are acting alone. She, Sabine pauses, thrown off for a moment by your re renunciation. Rabia takes this opportunity to act. She leaps from the stool and fainting past Sabine, grabs the baton and twists it inwards. She is by far the stronger, and she pushes Sabine to their knees, plunging the crackling end of the baton towards their chest. They freeze there, Sabine struggling to keep the crackling baton from their skin. Stop. Then you support them, Rabia asks you, her eyes not leaving Sabine. Your loyalties are so easily swayed. I thought you were more than Yannick's attack dog, Rabia. Sabine spits back. Are you not able to think for yourself? Rabia holds the baton strong, and for a moment you think she is about to hammer it down into Sabine's chest. But after a painful wait, she throws Sabine down instead, then spins the baton in her hand, thumbing a switch and turning it off, 
in a single move. Now what? They both look at you, each still catching their breath as if they had forgotten about your presence. Rabia cracks her neck. You were lucky I didn't kill you. I would have had every right. Every right, she shouts, the anger a release of tension more than a threat. Sabine lifts herself a little, bruised from the fall. They roll onto their side and cough. Rabia gives them some space, sitting back on the stool. Sabine uh, props themselves up on their elbows and fixes Rabia with a hard stare. You have something to say? Rabia taunts. Say it. This is your final opportunity. Because after this, she laughs, no coming back. What's the point? Sabine breathes heavily. She refuses to listen to criticism of the great yet again project. Rabia collects herself. Speak. She folds, herself, uh, folds her arms and waits to be convinced. Sabine takes a breath, organizing their thoughts. They go to start, pause, then decide on another approach. Eventually they say it. Yannick is a traitor. Urbaya immediately flinches, her eyes going to her prosthetic arm, her muscles clenching, but she rides it out, more eager to prove Sabine wrong than she had, is to hurt them, at least for now. When I came here from S and Arp, they glance at you, gauging your reaction. It was Yannick who was one of the first to support me, to look after me. I should have known then, but I was naive and afraid. Sabine turns to you. Sleeper, they take a breath. I know that I should have told you I worked for SNR long ago, but I thought you would abandon me, and you are my final friend. What you should know is that I left SNR because I was running for my life. I leaked documents on the sleeper program, on the illegal and immoral practices it relied on, to the press. SNR wanted me dead, and I fled as far as I could, to this refugee at the edge of the surrogate systems. Sabine stops to collect themselves. What does this have to do with Yannick? Rabia interrupts. The sleeper knows you are SN Harp, I told them, and while you hide beneath the cover of being a whistleblower, you and I both know you worked on the sleeper program. Yannick told me as much. Sabine's face falls. It is true. They glance at you and then away, ashamed. They lift their head. But it is Yannick, not me, who is in the pocket of SN Harp. Rabia flinches again. I can prove it. He made some kind of deal to keep me there. Uh, keep me here to tie me up in debt, to lock me away. In exchange, Rabia slams her hand on the desk. Just tell us, for God's sake. In exchange for those, Sabine finishes, nodding towards Rabia's prosthetic arm in its cradle. He has been using the Adagan enforcers, using you as test subjects for SNR technology. I have the data to prove it. He has been bringing them in under the guise of stolen shipments and having me fit them knowing each one is capturing data and sending it back to its makers. Rabia's fixed expression has started to fade. Sabine produces a slate. It's all here. Thousands of hours of usage data. Failure rates, error dumps. These are untested implants, Rabia. They could short out, fail, cause cascading failures across a person's body. And they have. Sabine suddenly looks incredibly tired. I thought the error rate in the units was down to them being stolen or modified. I have tried to fix hundreds of failures in my time here. Not all of them. They stop, unable to continue. Rabia closes her eyes and breathes in. Then she opens them again. She holds out a hand to Sabine. Show me, she says. Later, much later, when you leave, Sabine is still uh, taking Rabia through the manifest and usage data. Both of them crowded around the terminal as Sabine leads Grabaya through each layer of Yannick's betrayal. As you leave, Sabine catches your eye and something passes between you. Something like a thank you or a sorry or some other expression that communicates both sadness and hope. Welp. That's another upgrade point that I won't be able to make use of. Uh, Rabai and Sabine have been holed up in her office for a while now. What are they planning? Well, it doesn't matter to me. Goodbye. Sucks. Uh, I think this is still the same day, so I can't follow up on... What, what's her name? Uh, Ankita. So, I guess we're gonna go for our last sleep. Here. And, uh, this will probably be the last cycle. We'll see. 
we'll see how things play out. Oh, I was starving. Oops. I always do that. I have to use two scrap instead of one. Sleeper, Moritz is waiting for you on your way out. How has it been? Surviving? Moritz nods. That's the struggle. He glances around. He runs his hand through his hair. I've been... What hair? <laughs> I've been meaning to ask you, Sleeper. What's it like? He pauses suddenly, unsure. I mean, you know, what does it feel like? To be a sleeper? Yeah, he shrugs, if you don't mind. It's hard. It's strange. Yeah, I know I can't understand it, you know, with your frame and, well, everything else, but I wanted to say I have a lot of sympathy for it. Like, having to find a place, having to survive, having no future. He looks down. A lot of people around here understand that. Moritz looks away, and you notice him for the first time, not just as Bliss, uh, Bliss's assistant, but as someone with their own worries, their own struggles, their own life. You feel bad for not noticing it earlier. Moritz uh, looks back at you. Anyway, got a message for you. Bliss sent me down. We've sorted another contact, contract, and she needs your help. That's the message. He pauses. Look, I know last time the payment didn't come through, but you did good work. Bliss knows that. It's no problem. Okay, then. He pauses again. She's doing her best, you know. I know. See you up there. Moritz turns and strides off, leaving you in the corridor. Time to help Bliss, and maybe this time, you think, to yourself, it'll work out. Uh, oh, Ankita. Here you go. You spot Ankita on the track of the farm stack. She has a box on her shoulder and is working her way down the slope. She sees you as you, she approaches. Neither of you speak for a moment. She looks tired, pale, her ha hair is tangled in clumps of dirt clinging to her armor. You both eye each other. Stay silent. Sleeper. She takes a breath. I'm sorry for what happened. Truly I am. She looks down. I'm sorry you ended up in the middle of this. When all you have shown to me is kindness. She rubs her face. I'm sorry. Stay silent. For that sleeper that she stares at the floor. I'm sorry. She looks up, in a way, not meeting your eye. What you did is unforgivable. She looks at you. I understand. Ankita shifts the weight of the box on her shoulder. I've been preparing for her, she grimaces. Look, she sighs. Can you come with me? It's easier if... If what? You see it, she finishes. It's just down the way. Ankita leans on down the dirt path between the pillars. There's a wind, uh, wind passing through the greenway, a quirk of the air currents the biosphere maintains, and it ruffles the leaves softly. The sound makes the silence more obvious, more complete. You try not to think of the last time you were here. You've been trying not to think of it for the past few cycles. The image of the sleeper, sprawled, twisted open, connected to the ship mind, has been hard to forget. You realize Ankita's leading you back here, back there back into the drum at the center of the stack you pause trembling a little at the threshold she turns what are you doing she looks at you with empty eyes what needs to be done you stand on the threshold and look up at the tanks green and wet some glowing with flickering glow lamps you look down at ankita suddenly so small under this hulking ruin the smallest she has ever looked she places the box down follow her in you follow Ankita into the stack through a low tank, entering the drum at ground level. It is just as beautiful as you remember, but it barely touches you. Instead, you check the apertures of the tanks for the glint of a weapon or a shadow among the moss. Ankita stops and you look down. The mossy island at the center of the tank is clear now. The equipment, uh, the equipment cleared away. In its place is a mound of dirt, loosely covered with moss. Ashton's rifle stands straight, half buried in the dirt at the grave's head. I buried them together, Ankita says without turning. You both stand there in silence for a little while. You think of questions you could ask about Ashton and the sleeper. Was the sleeper dead? She takes a moment to respond, and for a moment you think she won't, but then the words come gushing out. Their body was long dead, that much was obvious. After you left I checked them, but there was nothing, no signal, no function. The ship mine was the same, dead. I know if Ashton's plan would have worked, he seemed desperate, but that doesn't mean it wasn't. She pauses, unsure how to continue. 
I don't think he was lying, but you have to understand, I've had crew members double-cross me, undercut me, rat me out. That's the business. He wasn't a good person. None of us in this job are, and this is how we die, alone. I'm sorry they had to die too. She stops, not sure of what to add. It seems like she is reaching for something, but she can't quite get there. You feel that gap between you, and as you do, it widens. The water drips, the moss trembles. You both stand in silence for a while longer. You both feel it, life creeping back in, the silence ending. And Kita shifts her weight, and then starts to walk out. You follow her, suddenly eager to go uh, be back out in the open space of the greenway, to be away from this place forever. You stand outside and breathe the fresh air. You stare at the green leaves and the stars wheeling above them. That's it, says Ankita, from somewhere behind you. You try to think of something to say but can't. Ankita puts a hand on your shoulder. You turn back to her. At least take this. She forces a handful of cryo chits into your hand. It's what I owe. She looks at you desperately. You look down at the metal bars. Ugly little things, you think. Drop the chits. You open your hand and let the chits fall to the floor. They clunk into the dirt, and she does not pick them up. You turn without saying a word and continue up the track. She does not follow. As you walk up the rise, the wind picks up and the leaves shudder. You walk faster, trying to outpace your anger. You think of those ugly metal bars in the dirt. A life has to be worth more than that. It has to be. Well, we got another upgrade point. The bad end. Oh, okay. Thanks, game. Appreciate you, bud. I guess I didn't do all the things. I guess it's my fault. Well, how much longer before we leave this place? Sycamore seed. Ugh. Jesus. Vent a section and you have a better chance of saving the remaining crops, but you will lose some in the process. The question is how many? Well, uh, I don't have a lot of time, so. Saving the crop. Try and do as much as we can. Uh, that was a positive outcome. I might just barely be able to do this. Well, nope, because I re-rolled badly. I get two positive outcomes somehow. Oh, good. A negative outcome. Wow, we just barely did it. You and Bliss are floating in the bay's airlock, waiting for it to cycle. You pick a few leaves from the, your clothes as you wait. They float around the chamber as if carried by a lazy wind. Clean work. Bliss bows a little. Well, thank you, sleeper. You didn't do so bad yourself. She checks her tool belt. Seems like we are getting into a good rhythm. The now familiar sequence of clunks and rattles sound out. And then the door hisses open. The moment it does, you know something has once again gone wrong. What's all this? Bliss asks a confused looking Moritz. Beside him are a set of crates anchored to the bay floor. He has clearly just brought them in through the bay's freight lock. Moritz looks nervously between the two of you before answering. It's payment. He runs a hand across the crate. Sycamore seed crew just brought them over. He stops, but seeing the look on Bliss's face adds, they were very thankful. <clears throat> I bet they were. She clenches her fist. What the hell is inside? Moritz leans over and struggles with the catches on each side of the top crate. As he does, Bliss turns to you. Don't say it. Bliss stares into space. Don't you dare say it. Say what? You know. She looks back at you. This isn't my fault. Moritz finally gets the catches free and the lid floats off, drifting up into the bay. As it does, a small brown lump floats up with it. Moritz catches, uh, reaches out and catches it as it passes him. Is that a uh, mushroom? 
Bliss finishes a damn mushroom. They paid us in mushrooms. Hey, those are those could be very valuable, honestly. Not just mushrooms. He holds out a clump of tightly packed leaves. Produce. Bliss starts laughing. Goddamn Haifa commune. Should have known they didn't have a chit to rub between them. She knocks a small brown mushroom across the bay. Stop, Bliss. Moritz grabs her hand. These are good. Fresh. We can sell them. To who, Moritz? Are we running a grocer's now? We need cryo. Otherwise, this whole bay will be shut down. We can't pay for parts with leafy greens. She waggles them in Moritz's face. Moritz is right. Bliss raises an eyebrow. Fine. Maybe Moritz is right, but what do we do between now and market day? She rubs her forehead. What a joke this place is turning out to be. Moritz closes up the crates and starts moving them. It isn't that bad, Bliss. It's a step in the right direction. He glances at you, looking for backup. They'll sell well. They'll sell well. Bliss sighs. Look, I like. Looks like I went into business with a couple of wannabe farmers. She laughs. Prove me wrong, then. Show me this is a windfall. She kicks away towards the new patched, uh, new patched together terminal. Until then, I'll be working on how to keep this place open. Moritz th uh, mouths a thank you and goes back to moving the crates. You'd better be on your way too. Well, did they give us? Did I just get Garol caps? I'll sell them. If I'd gotten Misataki, that would have been something. Oh, it looks like I, I can't sell the mushrooms here, actually. Welp. Eh... Uh, is that the last? Pretty much. All right. Well, let's uh, do our last sleep. We'll do it in the container, just for old time's sake. Oh, I'm starving. Let's grab uh, one last meal with Emphis. Too bad I couldn't have gotten those uh, Matsutake for Emphis. A darn shame. <coughs> Alright. This is the final sleep. fully repair ourselves and actually we'll grab our last meal now uh yeah we just barely don't get to see the conclusion of rabaya and uh what's her name what's their name all right Lem and Mina. There is a crowd, but you spot Lem and Mina immediately as you enter the dock. They are waiting at the cordon, where Sela's security are checking the crew and aboard the ship. Those that manage to get up to the hub are crowded near the entrance, but even they know their chance of getting on board has long gone. Wait. Something stops you calling out to Lem. Maybe it's fear or nerves, or just the need to take a little longer in this moment before your world changes once more. A decision was made, you reason, and there's no point in rethinking it again and again. All you can do is move forward in its shadow, until so many cycles pass that you forget it was even there. Lem spots you among the crowd. Sleeper, we are here. They are standing beside a bag which looks to carry all the positions they have. It is small enough to be carried in one hand. Hi, Mina. Mina is vibrating with excitement. She seems strangely at home in microgravity. But then you remember that she has spent her whole life in space. Hi, robot. You hand over the Celis ID film to Lem, keeping your own. He turns it back and forth in the light. Where did your friend even get this picture, sleeper? Looks like my old Conway ID. You look and a shimmering younger Lem stares out of the film, harder and cleaner cut. I spoke to the guard here. He nods to the white and green clad security officer. They'll be doing orientation and role assignment on board. 
Sounds like we are going to be working under the core crew. Kind of like an intern. He laughs. What do you think, Meanie? Am I too old to be an intern? Following Lem's lead, you inspect your ID. As you lift the film up to the light, you see something strange. Something that makes you flinch. The face printed in the film is one you recognize immediately, but it is not you. At least, it is not how you look now. You squint at this ghost, confused why you haven't noticed earlier. It is a picture you remember being taken, a memory that you didn't know you had. You remember signing the forms, the walk to the sleeper tanks, the cold metal floor. You remember the s and Arp employee who helped you in, her smile clean and surgical. You freeze in place, thinking of the you that still sleeps somewhere in an s and Arp facility. That work, that won't wake until you are recovered and disposed of, and now you are leaving. Will they ever wake up? Sleeper? Lem interrupts your thoughts. These guys want us to board. You stare at him without thinking. Then notice the guard, gesturing to you both to come forward. You all kick off and float over to them, steadying yourselves on the guardrail. You hang back, letting Lem present his ID film first. The guard slides it across a white machine, much like the one caster printed them from. You reflexively rub, rub the puncture mark on your hand, even th though there is no trace of it now. It seems to be your destiny to be someone else's tool. Lem and Mina are waved through, the guard smiling at her excited face. Lem turns back to check you are coming. The guard beckons you closer. Wait. You wait for a moment. You need to wait for a moment. This is all happening too fast, changing too much. There are so many questions you have, so many threads to catch hold of, and yet here you are, boarding a ship to know who knows where on a journey that will take decades. Reconsider. Is this really what you want? How will you even survive? You suddenly feel dizzy, unsettled. You can make out the concerned look on Lem's face as you look, uh, hold back. The guard gestures again. Mina's eyes, looking back at you, are so bright in the starlight. Now the question is, is if I didn't go, why would that prevent Lem and Mina from leaving? Like, this is the context I want. Like, uh, does Caster really have much to say in the matter at this point? He's given me the passes. I don't really have all that much loyalty to Caster. He's fine, but like, he didn't really give me much choice in the matter. He gave me some choice for sure, but, but here we are. We're doing this. You shake off your doubts and hand over your ID film. The guard barely looked at looks at it. It as they pass it through the scanner and wave you through. A new life built from old things. You okay? Lem asks, concerned as you catch up with them. You are so slow, robot. Mina teases, grabbing at you with small hands. Just making sure. Lem nods and you realize how much harder it must have been for him to cross that threshold. Mina struggles in his arms, trying to get to you, and Lem relents, struggling with uh, both the bag and his daughter. Mina tumbles through the microgravity and grabs onto your clothes for purchase, pulling herself into your arms. You all proceed up the walkway, the entrance to the docking bridge yawning wide and above you. Are we family, robot? Mina asks as you move, taking you by surprise. I guess so. Mina smiles and presses her head against your chest, pleased by your answer. You keep moving up into the docking bridge, then along that thin glass-walled connector, all the time Mina clutching onto you. A lack of gravity means you can't feel her weight, only the grip of her small hands on your clothes. You both stare wide-eyed at the vast hull of the sidereal horizon and try to think of this huge machine as a home. Later, when you settle into your bunk, after Mina has finished running back and forth between you and Lem with an endless and uh, infectious in, uh, excitement you find yourself looking at your ID film once more somehow since the last time you looked at it the image seems to have changed it is still a picture of the old you the person that signed up to have their consciousness copied and placed into the ownership of S and Arp but something else has crept into the image an underlying sense of self-identification this is also a picture of you you now the you that survived the I, that made friends here and found a way out, that escaped against all odds, 
The other you might never wake up. They might never live again, but so be it. They consigned you to a doomed life for their own gain. Their life is yours now. You will live it better than they ever could. You lie back on your bunk as the thrust of the side reel's vast engines kick in. This feeling, this rumble, will be your constant companion for the next decades. It will be there when you work, when you watch Mina grow, when you dream of the planet at the end of the journey. It will stay with you when your body starts to fail, despite the best attempts of Lem and Mina as the years stack up, and it exceeds its safe operating period by a decade. It will be the thing you wake up to in those rare moments of consciousness, between which Mina will keep you in a frozen state in the hope of preserving you until your destination is re reached. It will be it will still be there when Mina, uh, when Mina wakes you, tears in her eyes, to tell you of Lem's inevitable death, and it will not relent despite your desire for a moment of silence. It will be the final thing you hear as Mina shuts down all but the most vital of your functions and hopes beyond hope that you make it to your final destination, all the while doubting that you will. But for now, in this moment of departure, it is still a new sound, a new feeling, and because of this, it is filled with the promise of the future. And so you settle back on your bunk and close your eyes, and in moments you are sleeping a perfect dreamless sleep, the most peaceful thing that you can ever remember. Yeah, well, that's a, that's a bummer, dude. Well, that's a bummer, dude. That sucks a big one. That is exactly the last ending that I wanted. I feel, uh, like, sad, yeah, but, like, also emotionally manipulated. Not because, uh, you know, not, not for lack of a proper ending, not, not saying that this ending was, like, emotional man manipulation but i feel like when you present me with a choice of like hey do you want this person and their daughter to have the life they want or do you want to be selfish and stay and have the life that you want i don't know like i'm not saying they literally said that but that feels kind of like the ultimatum um given to me and so yeah it's uh it is what it is what what does uh continue look like is that just like the last cycle again like uh, you know I, I think at the end of the day maybe part of the point is that there isn't really much good um on offer for our character yeah this is just the last cycle again like we are definitely the result of you know poor life decisions uh you know we are the result of the 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 bad end of a of a capitalist society that preys on people's desire to prolong life and and there's not really much like no matter what ending we get it's not going to be great but the best we could have hoped for is to stay on that the refuge that we had created for ourselves and so the shittiest part is to be like pried away from that to basically a, a prison which is what I, the way I see that, I don't see that generational ship as anything more than a prison, uh, for our character, um, a, a, a basically a purgatory. And it's like, you know, Lem and Mina, nice, nice for y'all, I guess, except I get Lem, 
Lem doesn't get to have cryo sleep. So he just dies of old age. Cool. Like, well, like let's let's make it the absolute biggest bummer possible. Even after I make the the tough decision to leave the life I made for myself, the game doesn't even have the good grace to give me some kind of, you know, good ending. And if that's the point, then it still sucks, you know, like, in my opinion. I still think that sucks. Uh, so, I'm not satisfied by this ending, um, nor am I very happy with the events that led to it. Uh, were they, you know, caused by, you know, an, um, uh, uh, by unoptimal play on my part? Maybe. But at a certain point, I think that, like, decisions are made based on a lack of context. And I don't know what pathway I'm walking down. I can only try and, like, fulfill the threads that are presented to me. I don't know that which threads are going to lead to the proper conclusions. So, uh, you know, is that a is that a shortcoming of the genre? Is that a shortcoming of the game? Or is it just a reality that you're not going to always like the ending that you're given and you can't really complain about it? I'm going to complain anyway, so shut up. <laughs> Either way. Uh, if you have enjoyed the series, definitely, you know, help me out and hit the like button. Uh, part of this is done for your entertainment as well. There will not be a second campaign. Because uh, a lot of it would be repeat, I think. I don't think that it would be worth doing replaying the game. I, I think that it would be so much repeat that there's like nothing, there's no novelty left over. I tried to cover as much as I possibly could with, outside of maybe the DLC. Like I was unable to get to the DLC, period. Um, so anyway, hit the like, consider subscribing despite my grievances, and I'll see you guys next time. Take it easy.